everyone, and it is time to get trash talking again with none other than Pistol Pete Hooley. Mate, it's good to be allowed back for another one, and then, once again, we've got a lot to talk about. Well, I managed to pull some strings to get you back for one more week. No, Jeez, I'm joking. You're a good Pete, bloke. Pistol Pete here every single week. We have this one going every Tuesday, every single week. And now, it's, it's not the NBL without the usual storylines we get every week. And this week, we're, we're kind of doubling up on last week with the Mellow Ball triple-double well, and some more refereeing controversy. Well, you talk about triple-double when we get stuck <laughs> into it properly. I believe upon review, they may have questioned it, but I think it's been solidified now. But I watched the game and it's interesting. They questioned it and the uh, the NBL marketing panel would have decided that, no, we're going to keep this one as a triple-double. Well, it's hard when you put it out there and he, the amount of media that takes off and the likes and the interaction has been huge. But I watched the game in a couple I believe it comes down to the statistician's discretion on what is an assist, yeah. technically. So a lot are uh, one dribble, two dribble. But when you're throwing them... It was LeVar Ball. But judging by the looks of some of those assists, <laughs> was either LeVar Ball or Jermaine Jackson. One of the two on, on the, the score bench taking well, it those it depends. Assists. Like Tim Conrad likes to just get him up, which is an easy person to throw an assist to. But then you have a lot. He had a lot that people missed bunnies. That would have solidified it easily. Oh, he, he's had some games here. Same with Machado, though, over at Cairns. He's had some games where he could have got... 10, 15, Assist, 16, 100%. 17. We're probably not going into the 20 range there. But are you sold on this? Now, I hate to sound like the dude that comes in every week. Oh, you're not on the train on that. I'm not on the train with this. One for 11 from three, mm-hmm. 10 from 28. This wasn't a triple-double that we look at and we're like, oh, holy shit. The, the one that he did against Cairns and propelled them to the win? Yeah, that was great. Defensively, barn door. Yes, and he was again. <laughs> he, he was shocking on defense again this week. But you know what? I, I can forgive that. Because he's, he's improving in those areas. But a 10 for 28 is not a great triple-double. Yeah, way to pass the ball, young fella. But that's not going to help your draft stock. Don't, don't go around saying back-to-back triple-doubles, he's locked himself in the number one pick. 10 for 28, 1 for 11 from three. The biggest knock on him so far has been defense and three-point shooting. Two things that he miserably failed at in that game against New Zealand. It's still You can't take away from the fact that nobody's done this in the 40-minute era before. The last person was Darnell Me in the 48-minute era. To have a triple-double or close in 40 minutes is ridiculous. So you've got to give him hats off to that. But I was watching the game and with about... Seven minutes to go, I think he had a three board sign to go. He was hanging around, as you would. If oh, as you close. would. And I, and I hate it when people, like, he's not exactly, I forgot the name of the NBA player that did it, that threw the ball off the backboard of the other team's hoop to oh, try to get his triple double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know the one. Uh, but no, I, agree, I have to agree with you, but I still, it's still an accomplishment that you have to be able to celebrate. It's something that's ridiculous, but it's also, he played against the Breakers without a f- few players, and they still lost. You're right. They didn't play very yeah, well. Yeah, it wasn't an unbelievable performance that everyone makes it out to be. In, in in no way. He was there was no one else for the Illawarra Hawks to score. He had to take it on. He had a shocking night from the field. You're going to hunt out those rebounds when you well, know you're a chance for the triple double. Here's my thing: if he doesn't have that triple double the week before, are you going to give him more props because he's got a triple double? Probably. It's because he had such a really good, impactful triple double the week before. Well, and I think that's. A, and you are the only person completely not on the Lamello train. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm on the Lamello train, but I've said before, I'm holding him to a higher standard because I reckon that he can be a number one pick. Well, he can, but that, we've spoke about this. It depends on who wins the draft lottery, what team he goes to. So he could have another triple double every game for the rest of this season. But if Golden State ends up with that pick, they're probably not picking him. Well, it's also you got to remember the incident. When the NCAA tournament rolls around, it takes someone to have one 30, 40, hasn't happened before, I don't think, but maybe a 50-point game, and all of a sudden they shoot up the draft stops. Cole Anthony comes out and drops 35 in an NCAA tournament win. Then we start seeing some massive change. We see the hype that follows around. That's why there's so many draft mistakes, because it works so much on hype. Yeah, agreed. And I remember a few years back, Spike Albrecht from Michigan yeah. Yeah, came in and gave buckets <laughs> in the final four. Hey, Luke Hancock was giving it to him on the other end, though, as well. And then so I'm pretty sure you end up going down and getting a pro gig from that. Work at Foot Locker now. <laughs> uh, Xavier Cooks signs with the Kings. Now, this is some big news. I don't want to talk about the Mallow Ball for the next week until he gets a triple double next week and we're back in the same spot. But Xavier Cooks signing with the Kings. Now, it's, this is absurd. I don't reckon it's that absurd. He's playing, from what I've heard, he's playing for minimum this year. You've heard that from a false person. No, he's playing for minimum this I year. He's on a big back-end deal because their salary cap doesn't get affected because they cut Kwani Kwani. Right. And he's on minimum. So it doesn't affect their salary cap. So nothing... I don't understand all the I heard, uproar. I heard actually different from a source over the weekend. What did you get? Tomato sauce? Where'd you get that one that from? That he is from one of the all-time greats that he is... I didn't tell you anything. He's doing a little bit better than you think because from what he got told, what Illawarra had put on the table... And then Sydney had gone and given a little bit more than that. So that's just what I'd heard. But either way, this signing is incredible for the Kings. But on the salary cap, a lot of people don't know. And I only just had this like clarified myself is 
when you have the marquee player rules or whatever, I think there's three yeah. of them that go on in the salary cap books as a certain amount. So for instance, say it's your best player is in the books for 350. But you can pay them whatever you want. But they're in the books yeah. for that price. So Casper Ware, I'm assuming. Well, Bogut. Bogut. Bogut is the, say Bogut's the marquee the first one. Uh, and then Casper Ware's the second one. Yeah. Say he's on the 250 in the books. But they can pay him whatever. Yeah. So a lot of people are like, oh, Sydney Kings, Melbourne United. They're millions over the cap. Technically, they're not. That'd be over. Paul Smith no. came out and said they're over, as they would be. Yeah. But it's not as crazy as people think because they're within the rules. They're doing the right thing by the rules. But adding Xavier Cooks is more... Take the salary cap out of it. This guy's legit. Oh, he's he's a, but but it's also he's not just legit on the offensive end. He he is a legit defensive player of the year caliber guy in the NBL. And you pair him with Bogut and Will Weaver's defensive schemes as a coach, you got a pretty dangerous lineup. The only thing that hurts me, we talk about how important chemistry is, is he's going to take. He's not coming to play less than twenty five minutes. He's going to impact Jay Sean Tate's minutes, who's been balling a lot. Brad Newley's minutes when Kev Lish comes back. You're going to have to put Didi down to the two, you'd assume, a little bit. So everyone's going to get muddled around, and then it's going to become a little fixing time of making sure everyone's happy, everyone's on the right page. So it'll take some time, yeah. as we've seen with Melbourne United, with Casey Prather coming back. But again, you can't pass up the opportunity to get Xavier Cooks in. Well, that's the thing. And by the time it comes, when he actually steps on the floor and the Sydney Kings are seven, eight, nine, ten games ahead in first place, which it won't matter. Yeah. They, it, it won't, won't matter. matter. They, they can lose five games on the trot mm-hmm. and probably still finish first because they're clearing away the best team in the competition now. But, but what do you think of ditching your... So Eric Cooks, the assistant coach of Illawarra. What are we saying about Xavier Cooks ditching his dad who you never know. This signing could come back to hurt Eric Cook. This sign, Xavier Cook signing with the Kings could come back to hurt Eric Cooks because with the, the lack of success they've had at Illawarra, they, they, some heads could be on the chopping block. Well, I find it hard to believe he didn't run it by his dad. I'm sure no, that we know We, we <laughs> know that happened. They're having a good chat about it. And he's probably looked at, this is more so, he wants to be in the NBA. And we, we, there might be a little connection here. Give us your theory on... Uh, well, we yeah. heard some theories from a couple of friends of ours um, <laughs> that obviously Brett Brown knows Will Weaver and Philly and might be able to help him get to the NBA. But he wants to get to the NBA. So it's more that I think his dad would have eventually come down and said, look, you have to do what's right for you and all this kind of stuff. I kind of like... I would... I prefer to see him on this Kings team. So do I. Because you, who are you learning around as well? And I also came out and said, I know it was shut down by the CEO of Sydney Kings, but this might be further to our point from last week that Didi might be ready for a plane ticket anytime soon. And they might have to cover that up, but that could be it. And that could be very, very well covered up by bringing in Xavier Cooks. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm, I'm not buying it with the DD stuff. I don't buy it at all. I, I can buy that this is a move by either Brett Brown with a good connection to Will Weaver. These guys have coached together before to say, hey, you take him under your wing here with the Boomers. But then from what I've heard from a Boomer is that Will Weaver may not be involved See, I because it's Brett Brown and his Philly coaching staff that he works with year round. I'd be disappointed with that. I'd be super disappointed. I, I think- like Will Weaver and what he's done. And I think he'd be the perfect guy to have in the lead up games to then just go in and Brett Brown come in for the Olympics and stuff. So I'd be disappointed if that's true. I'd be disappointed because we're not developing potentially our best coach we have in this country on an international scale. Because I see Will Weaver as a guy that he's going to eventually. And I know we're, holy, we're, yeah, holy we're jumping here. But, yeah. but we're not... No, no, no. There is, there is no topic here. But the, the fact that Will Weaver is, one, arguably our best coach that we've got. Still young, so I can understand why you don't want to throw him into the Boomers head coaching role right away. But we're not just clutching at straws here because he's had a great amount of success with a loaded Kings roster. He had success over in the States. He's one of the most well-regarded coaches we have. He needs to be involved in that program. I agree, and I've I heard that rumor similarly to you over the last couple of weeks, and I'd be very disappointed if he wasn't part of it. But back on the Xavier Cooks, I think you got to do what's best for yourself and your career. And right now, you're learning how to be a pro from Andrew Bogut, who was in the league doing great things for so long. You got Casaware, you got Lish, you got Newley, who's been a tremendous pro for years. So I think he's in the right spot. We're, now we're harping on for a bit too long about Xavier Cooks, but the last thing there, do you think it did better? It would have been better for his NBA goals to play alongside Mallow at Illawarra and be a focal point of the offense or go to the Kings or potentially be kind of stashed this year and then break out next year? And, and is he even going to break out on that loaded roster? We're not sure. Not to the extent that he potentially could with the Illawarra Hawks. But and the, you've got the NBA eyes on you from Lamelo. But ball. there's a lot. The ball is in Lamelo's hands 90% of the game. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like, what are you going to get too much out of playing with Lamelo? Because it's Lamelo's team and there's no doubt about it. Everything's ran through him. Everything's about him. So maybe he's a little hesitant on, I don't want to go in there, A, disrupt that, 
because then it looks bad. And obviously, as you said, the, all eyes are on the Hawks every time. But now everyone's looking at the league as well. So I still think it's an okay decision to go for Sydney. And if I, if I had Xavier Cook's talent, I might have done You would be the sitting in thing. a studio and me on call. <laughs> you would be sitting in a studio with, with me a on guy who went of 6 on debut. No, I wouldn't <laughs> oh, be. You're right. Where was You're it right. coming from? <laughs> no, but okay, we'll move on. There's enough Xavier Cook's talk and we'll continue on with the Sydney Kings. Sydney Kings taking on Melbourne United. 50 fouls in the game, virtually turned into an unwatchable contest. Thoughts, queries, concerns. I was I was calling this game and it was it was just first off, credit to the Sydney Kings. They went out there with a game plan. They said, you know what, we're attacking their defense, we're putting head on the rim. They didn't take a three until like one minute to go in the third uh, first quarter. They That's just put sickening. their head on the rim. And it was just straight bully ball and they were getting by. A lot of fouls early started and they were fouls. But here's my issues with this. You're setting the tone by calling these fouls early. Then they kept when with they didn't adjust the referees. They just kept doing it the whole way through the game. You had good players fouling out. There was flops from either side the whole game. So many fouls. The game went forever. This is a one of the biggest rivalries we'll have this year. Everyone's picking these two to be in the championship, and you're going to treat it like a netball game where you can't get within three feet of someone. It's going to be physical. There's going to be a lot going, but if you don't have guys uppercutting and clotheslining each other, let them get away with a little bit of physicality. Yeah, the, no, the refs laid an absolute egg on this one, and, and it's hard because they were consistent throughout the game, but, and that's all you ask is consistency as a ref. True, but all you ask is the, consistency. The tone was set, and a lot. granted, a lot of them probably were fouls early, but there were so many from that point that just weren't, that didn't need to be called. Dave Barlow got five fouls in eight minutes, and every single foul is the exact same. Standing there yeah. as he does with his really strong armbar and st- strong standing up and moving. Jay Sean Tate's obviously quicker than him, but he had the same thing every time. And it's like he turns around and is like, what can I do? The refs will obviously tell him, try do this. Next time happens, exactly the same. No, and then he's sitting down. But there's also and, – and, and Melbourne United fans, and, and you know we are fairly loyal to Melbourne United, but I, well, I also understand. <laughs> <laughs> I am to you rocking the Melbourne United hat on today. But you can't complain here because Melo Trimble was a beneficiary – of a pretty dodgy call to win the game in Melbourne. There's been Melbourne have been on the receiving end of some dodgy calls to get wins if before. We're talk- so no, we're, yeah, you it's... can't look at this and act like we're like Melbourne United are getting hard done by by the officials because they've gotten lucky a couple of times already this season. It's not about. It's literally both sides of it. Both sides like Melbourne had a lot of things go against them, but there was still some bad calls for against the Kings in this game. I'm saying both ways. You got to let those kind of teams play, and obviously there was a couple of flops from both teams that started to just get in and under the skin. And then players are sitting down on, on foul trouble early. Didi even got fouled out, I believe, as well. So there was like four guys fouled out. So I'm saying it was both ways. I'm not just one. Early, I mean, uh, Sydney had 19 free throws at quarter time. Credit them, put their head down going on the rim. But probably half of them, if you're in a big rivalry game, you don't want to see that. Where, who are we paying to see to go watch these games? Michael Allen. No, we're no, paying, I'm paying to see. No, we're paying to go and see these guys on the floor. And if you know, this game was built up. Everyone, Melbourne versus Sydney, they hate each other, all this kind of stuff. Everyone was excited. And it was like a techno concert at the start. <laughs> Whistles going wherever. You've seen White Chicks. <laughs> Terry Crews in White Chicks with the whistle. That's, what, that's exactly what it was like. <laughs> we need that footage thrown up there. But anyway, it's time for Word That A Cut Loose. We all know where those standard rants, and we're just going to hope that he keeps his language to a minimum here and doesn't get us both fired with what he's about to say. G'day there, fellas. My first round is going to go against myself, and that is never take a text message on face value, especially when at a work Christmas party. Secondly, the Perth Wildcats are in trouble. And yes, we say it every year, and yes, they find themselves getting out of the hole. But I feel like this year might be a little bit different. On the weekend, I got an up-close and personal look at the Perth Wildcats while sitting on the Adelaide 36ers bench. And while Bryce Cotton did his thing, he still wasn't the Bryce Cotton of old. Nick Kay definitely has a boomer's hangover at the moment and is no way as consistent as what he was last year. Tariqa White is coming back from injury and he didn't look right. And Dario Hunt, well, he just got his ass busted by Daniel Johnson. But maybe it's not what's happening on the court that's the issue. Maybe it's what's happening off the court. After winning a championship last year, Matt Nielsen, the coach in waiting, leaves for San Antonio. Uh, Adam Ford goes to the Sydney Kings under Will Weaver and even their team manager, Brett, finds himself up in cans with the Taipans. Maybe things aren't right in the Wildcats camp, especially under Trevor Gleeson. 
Now, Trev got a new deal, as he should, after winning a championship. But it seemed to be at the sacrifice of a few good men that helped him along the way. Now, I know Matt Nielsen had a lot to do with keeping the group together and the players really respected him and both him and Forty. So, boys, does the coaching staff play that much of a role that helps with the team? And did the Wildcats do the right thing by re-signing Trevor Gleeson to lose Matt Nielsen? Food for thought. Why on earth does Wertho sound like he's reading an emotional eulogy every time he gets on one of these rants? But yeah, look, there's, it's founded. I, I always find it hard to talk about the Perth coaching staff purely because Perth has won four championships in six years. It, it, it's so hard for me to fathom, and this is just the, the culture of sports we live in, that Trevor Gleeson has to sit there and have his job in question when he has had so much success and they are sitting second on the ladder right now with arguably... And I don't know why it has to be that way with the amount of money this club generates. And I haven't checked their tax <laughs> returns and that sort of stuff. But when you pack that many people into an arena, you usually do all right all wearing red. They don't lose many games. And this dude has always spoken about, oh, Gleason needs to go. And then the Perth Wildcats just find a way to get back. To answer where those questions, if there was something already in the last couple of years in place that the whole staff knew that Matt Nielsen was going to take over... And then right after he wins a the title, they said, you know what, we're taking our word back on that. That's a lot different. But I That's don't know. Huge. That, is, there, is there any founded but I'm, info Exactly. On but you talk about Perth lay eggs every year. Yeah. The when most comes, inconsistent championship team every year. But they're it's, always there down the stretch. Yeah. And we're going to talk about a few of these other uh, roster guys a bit later on this. But Perth Wildcats always seem to know when to peak. And you're, he's right. Tariko White just came back from injury. Bryce Conn and Nick K is the big one. Like we expected Nick K to, he's still having a good year, but we expected Nick K to dominate. Well, after after the way that he performed at the World Cup, everyone came in with massive lofty expectations. But he's a, he's a workman. That's what he is. He's not, a, in my opinion, he's never going to be a marquee player. He's a workman and he does his job. But I think Werther's right on the fact that coaching staff does matter and does help a lot. Because, oh yeah, because the assistant coaches, as like past professionals, we know. We have more to do with assistant coaches who are perhaps guard assistant coaches or bigs on the day-to-day basis. The head coach is going to be there for obviously the overall meetings, all that kind of stuff, on-court stuff. But you have so much to do. When I had a problem, I'd go to like Paul Hanare, all that kind of stuff. He was in charge of the guards and I built that relationship with him. So if you guys like Bryce, maybe Bryce had that real good connection with Adam Ford, all that kind of stuff. Having those changes, it does impact it. But having having said that, Perth are going to be there when it matters. They're sitting second for a reason. So brave people. People have doubted. And I remember sitting in this same room yeah. last year. Were they on homicide? Both doubted. No, nah, you Said can't. that Perth couldn't make it. They were done. And until, I started to think of it, but I still backed them in. Until they prove us wrong by that and have a complete crap second half of the year and everything just falls to pieces, you can't take it away from them. They're going to be there when it matters. Uh, but we're also hiding over the fact that he came out the first part of his rant <laughs> with something that we'll also talk about. We're going to touch on that later. <laughs> we'll touch on that, uh, that whether, whether Wertho did get thrown under the bus there. But first of all, now you told a story last week. About you. Of my fake Gold Coast hamstring bender. It's time for you to flip one back on yourself. And yeah, I'm not going to tell your story this time like you told my well, story you, last well, time. I was there for yours. I was on the same plane. But this is... a. Uh, Last year, we went and played Philadelphia and Toronto. We spent 15 days in the States. So we went and played Philly. The night after we played was the AFL Grand Final. Mm. But the next day, we drove to New York City. And we had two days there before we went to Toronto. Then we had a week before that Toronto game. So I'm, I went to college in New York. So I knew a lot of people there. I know my way around. So we went out there, a few of the guys, had a few drinks, just and tried to enjoy ourselves. Was it someone special's birthday on that weekend as well? And who of a player? No, it wasn't Larry's birthday. Oh, it might. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah but How we, do you forget that? It's the owner go, of the league, our, our overlord, our saviour. But that's birthday. not where that's not where the players went. So we were just, <laughs> just so we and we were staying in, uh, around Times Square, and we had the Saturday, and I, I went to the Australian, the bar in New York City. Shout out those guys. I love those guys. I've always gone there a lot. So we had a great time watching the replay of all this kind of stuff. The next day, we were supposed to have training at the Knicks facility, which is twenty kilometers north of Times Square. So anyway, whatever time we get home and wake up and I'm just like, oh, geez, I don't feel too good. A few of us have felt a bit average. I'm like, I can't train right now. I can't possibly yeah. come downstairs, feel the coaches, feel the staff. They have enjoyed Larry's party. They're feeling a little <laughs> same. We get on this bus, big bus, 
Three and a half hours it took us to get to the Knicks facility. In stop and start traffic because of you're in Times Square in a massive coach. And we're sitting at the back and I'm like, oh, this is the worst I've felt in a long time. And it stops start and I'm just like, I'm, I can't train. I was like, this is going to be the hardest thing I ever have to get through. I've done that before. College, you've done it before. Oh, I've He's, done it. I've virtually done it every bus trip I've ever been and on. And you're normally just like, oh, after the workout, I'm going to feel good. But a few of us, I'm thinking, this is really going to hurt. I'm, this is not going to be good for us. The longer we got stuck in traffic, the more we're like, this is going to get cancelled. Sweet. <laughs> so we eventually get close and we'd missed our time. It's at the Knicks facility. So we only had a certain amount of time. We're driving around this like inside. There was all these buildings. They can't find it. There's one guy who's standing inside like a fence waving us down. And one of the players was like, oh, there he is. And everyone's like, shut up. <laughs> so we ended up doing a couple of laps. We get in there and I'm like, I can't possibly do this. And Dino's like, we're just going to have a little individual, 15 minutes, do a little tour and we'll be out. I was like, this is great. Lace the shoes up, still not feeling good. My individual was with a few of the guys doing like tough layups and stuff. With Dino hip and shouldering and tackling us. And that is a thick dude. And he's a Dino's strong man. Dino's a little man. ball of muscle. And this really, really hurt me. And I look over and a couple of guys, aka Chris, Barlow, these guys are shooting free throws. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really struggling. And we got through it somehow, but we had a three and a half hour trip back. We get to times, we ended up leaving. I think we left at 12 p.m. We ended up getting back at about 9.30 at night. We get off the bus. A few of the staff are wearing sunnies. <laughs> it's 9.30 at night. They're still not feeling too good. Ended up getting Shake Shack. But that's one of the worst things. And people want to know what goes on on those kind of trips. That yeah, was just people, a one-off. If people wonder about salary caps and stuff, the teams that are well over the salary cap, that's usually how they're traveling. When a coach. In terms of the, <laughs> the long bus trip, stuff like that. Like in America, like people don't, there's no business class going on right now. No. Nah. In terms of this ain't the NBA yet. Well, it was more so, I don't think they, uh, didn't, they didn't account for the fact that you're going to be stuck in the most ridiculous traffic in the world in a coach. It's yeah, not like you that. can strictly, uh, quickly get through a little intersection. No, you're sitting there. It was supposed to be 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, yeah. and it took three and a half hours, and it was the most painful thing ever. Pete Murray, better days, was just playing <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Anthem. Okay, we're going to go rapid fire through the rest of this. In play or out of bounds? Our man, Corey Homicide Williams, throwing Mark Worthington under the bus. We're going to play this clip real quick and let us know whether you think this... Let us know on Twitter after this. Hashtag Trash Talk SB, whether you think that Homicide threw Wertho under the bus here. Sorry, sorry, guys. I have to cut you guys off. I just got a text Uh that is a blockbuster signing. I don't know if it's true. Uh Uh-oh. But I'm going to say it is because Mark Worthington just texted me and said... Perth Wildcats Uh-oh. just signed Sean Livingston. What? <laughs> what are you? I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. Sean Livingston from the Golden State Warriors. There's only one Sean Livingston well, that plays best. How basketball. many imports are they allowed up there in Perth? They allowed four imports? I don't already know. got three. Now that is an all-time throwing under the bus. Now, were they explained this on Twitter that he forgot to add the question mark to the end of that? I was going to be... Sean Livingston signed with Perth. And and for those who don't know, it came from a satire article on the Hoops Forum. Which are everywhere. There, there's, there's so many of them. It's just almost like you can't take anything like that without hearing other things. But you don't throw them now. You, you can't just get information like that and throw it out. Now, I'm fine with throwing it out there and putting it under your name. But throwing Paul Wertho out there with it was where I drew the line on that one. Yeah, I'm just... So it's out of bounds for you, obviously. It's out of bounds. It's, out, it's, it's, it's when we're going to see something later on. <laughs> Actually, when we're talking about out of bounds, can we jump to the footage right now? Because there was an out of bounds that happened with Thomas Abercrombie on a little chess pass. Now, Brandon Ashley, as we have a it look at Brandon it. was Brandon Ashley. Let's, let's throw to that footage. Oh. Oh. Right in the kisser. <laughs> now, 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 the thing here was, first of all, can we have a look at the guy in the black shirt right now? who doesn't appear to make too much of an effort to stop that ball from At hitting all. the poor little girl. Here it is. And he's just moving out to the side. Bang. Mm. Oh, my goodness. This reminds me, if you've got time, jump on YouTube and search Amazing Race Watermelon. Oh, now that is the most brutal, brutal hit That reminds time. me. This poor little girl is just taking it straight. And he just said, the guy next to him is just like, I'm filming. <laughs> get out of my way. But Abercrombie's the one in fault here. You can't fake a back door. No. He's done that, and then he slipped over to make it worse. But Brandon actually went over there and made sure she was okay. Well, the coolest thing was they showed footage afterwards, and she was laughing, like that sort of thing. So if I take a hit like that, you're going to have to drag me out of that stadium. Well, I'm 
it happened last year with Mitch Creek diving into the stands and, and hit someone in the <laughs> face. But Brandon Ashley or Thomas Abercrombie buy her a toy for Christmas. She needs a jersey or something. something. They, need, they need to work something out. Anyway, it's time for hot or cold. We're going to run through, through these ones nice and quick. Hot or cold, Dario Hunt needs to be replaced for the Wildcats to remain in championship contention. I know you're going to say hot. I'm saying cold because I think he's had some really good games. It's just about finding the consistency, but the Perth haven't found that consistency yet. I like him. He's played really well in some games. I think you've just got to work out. They came last year. They said, we're going with our roster. We're going to get it done. And they did. Well, the thing that uh, when we look at last year, Tariko White had what some would consider a fairly lacklustre season for his credentials. And then he came out and won the finals MVP and completely dominated Melbourne. And had one of the greatest speeches of all time. (laughs) (laughs) Hot or cold? Sydney can be the league. Hot or cold on that? No, I'm hot. You think he needs to go? Yeah, I, I, think they, I think they need to make a switch there. Okay, because you're not getting that same production from Nick Kay, what we expect or what they expected, where you can live with Dario Hunt underperforming. Interesting. Hot or cold, Sydney could be the league's next dynasty. Dynasty, dynasty, however you want to pronounce it. It's like dynasty, Derby, Derby. I, on I'd go one. dynasty and it's definitely Derby. Uh, and it's definitely <laughs> Palmy. Uh, uh, how many years is like would be classified as a dynasty? Because they've got some older guys. So oh, yeah, say, that, that's, that's the issue. Man. That's why cold. I'm sort of going cold on I'm it saying because cold. I reckon they're great. And if Will Weaver can stay there, then yeah, but I reckon Will Weaver's got some lofty aspirations for his coaching career and he might not be in this country for They've too long. They've got four guys over 32 years of old. How long's Bogey got to go? And, and he's proved a lot of people wrong every single year. 100%. Brad Newley, Kevin Lish, he's starting to come. Don't jump back injuries. on Bogut's bandwagon. You trashed him last week. What did I say you last week? You called him a hypocrite last week for his the salary cap thing. Well, I think he's one of the best players in the league. If I could start a team right now, I'd probably start with having him on my team. Do I think oh. his statements were hypocritical? That's not trash. <laughs> that is not trash. I'm saying cold based enemies. on based on age, but they're going to be good for the next couple of years. Yeah, I think as well with Xavier Cooks, if they can hold on to him, which again, it's all about where they can hold on and to And Casper's it. bought into Sydney. He, he's got a multi-year deal there. Yeah, well, just be... like they said that he'd bought into Melbourne. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Some people on Twitter have asked, and I do digress here, on what, and, and I know you're quite close with Casper. Very. How much extra money... Well, you don't have to name a figure. Just give us maybe a bit of a percentage jump on what his salary was at Melbourne versus what he's getting at Sydney. But I don't know what he was on at Melbourne. All I know that I wasn't on much. So I know he was on a lot more than me. <laughs> You're on more but than me. It's Casper Ware, so whatever they... But I think he was more, obviously, Because I've heard numbers thrown around in the 750 to 800 range. Everybody's heard numbers. That's why they like to throw numbers out there because I could come in one day and say, I heard this and you'd run with it and then you'd throw me under the bus on commentary. No, nah, I, I, I would. I would throw you under yeah, the bus No, but I think he's just taking the best move for himself and he wanted to get that change of scenery and Bogut obviously probably had a phone call or two in there so he's just done the right thing for himself and you can't hate him for that and if he gets more money on the way good on him more money less problems isn't but, that how it goes I don't think so no, but it's cold more money more problems Casper Ware hot or cold Daniel Johnson deserves to be mentioned in the best centre discussions averaging 16 and 8 at the, at the moment and arguably what who a lot of people think is the best centre in the league Sean Long who I still think it's Andrew Bogut but he's averaging 18 and 9. So there's not much differential, and the 36ers are starting to hit their straps right now. Hot, but he does play a little bit of the power forward. Hot. As well. I, I love DJ. I love the way he. Did you say DJ? Daniel Johnson. Oh, okay, yeah, my bad. I thought you said someone else. No, DJ. I know DJ. I personally, I <laughs> played with him in Adelaide. He's a terrific player, and he just goes about things a lot differently than a normal center would. He likes a fadeaway. He's got a little handle on him. He's got little chicken legs. He's got little stick chicken legs. He doesn't look athletic at all. You look at Sean Long. He's jumping out of the gym. It's entertaining. Bogut's blocking the hell out of people. Daniel Johnson just gets like some really boring buckets but ends the game like he did last week. He's a little... 27 and 17. That's a monster game That's in huge. Perth. For no, a he win. does for the sake of what he can do. He had a couple off weeks but so have all the other centers. Shout out to DJ. That's hot. You deserve to be in the best center of the league conversation. Hot or cold? Hawks need to focus on player development and give up the search for this extra in point. In point. Maybe even the search for the extra info, whichever way you want <laughs> to go hot with this, that. Aren't you? Yeah, no, I'm hot. Nah. You're going to finish last anyway. Nah. New Zealand are going to crawl out of this little hole and their nah. actual talent is going to get them through. Cold. They're going to finish last. Cold because Lamelo is going to be not lasting the year. It doesn't. Even, that's even better nah. for the Hawks' development no, because you have young talent in Angus Glover, Greta, who has barely seen the court, Emmett Nah. The only way you can win, Aaron Fern did it with the Cairns Taipans. You need retention, you need young guys to hang around that club. The only way to do that is that they know, you know what, if, if Dan Greeter, Angus Glover, these guys are like, you know, I'm, I'm playing here. Look, I agree on that part, but it's cold. If Lamelo, if he plays the whole year, which a lot of people think he will, he's going to need someone else around at some point. It could get real ugly real quick. It already has at some times. That beat Cairns. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else after that. that beat Cairns. Yeah, the, the last 18 games have so been Cairns five times. They need someone else just to help and there's so help much. Help what? 
Just to help the production of the team. There's oh, the production so, of the team to get to what? Second last at the end of the year? It doesn't You're matter. You're going to pay all You've that money for second last? every eye on him. Every eye is on that team. When people from America think about and the they've NBL, already set the scene. They've already set the scene. Uh, I, you know what? No one's no one's going viral saying, man, the Illawarra Hawks just lost to the Taipans. First off, and LaMelo got a triple You're double. talking about getting these young guys. I think you need to do that. Every team needs to do that in the league. That's something we'll have to talk about in the coming weeks. I've got a lot to say on that. But Sunday, Detch has already broke out as a That's the what next I mean. guy. And he's a guy that you now need to develop. Why bring in some journeyman import from another club from some European club, some journeyman who's going to come in there and steal a whole bunch of minutes on from this, Emmett Nah. On uh, this, I heard, I heard they already had a couple with very close to pen to paper and right at the last minute, one pulled out and one had their couldn't get out of their Europe deal. It's funny how the universe works. One of these guys pulled out and then all of a sudden Sunday Detch goes for 20 points. I like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm warm. <laughs> I'm no, lukewarm I am on absolutely that. hot. Run the development. I want to see the Illawarra Hawks be great. And I actually believe that Matt Flynn, he's been around this club long enough. I believe that he can have success with this club. But you need retention when you're one of these small market teams and you need to grow your talent that you've already got. You're not going to be able to afford the big time imports. Grow the talent. If, if it was round one, then yeah, okay, get a replacement. Because I the believe they have a player and signing soon, but I think it's an Aussie. Ooh. Yes. Don't you just leave that little teaser out for me and not... No, I, that's all I've I'm heard. I'm a fish just biting that's at this little That's all I've heard. Hook. But if it does come back to be true and the name <laughs> gets thrown out there, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. His name is... They, oh, I believe, I believe have the, they, the have so, they have someone coming from another team. Okay, so you've just... Dro- so this is the bomb that you've dropped. The Illawarra Hawks are going to get someone from another team. Yes. Move on. Okay. Yeah, there will be a game decided this week by... Buckets. That is the most general, general no, from statement. Another team. I don't know. I don't want to hear. Another I want to hear in the NBA. We're going to talk about. We spoke about Casper Ware, one of your mates, but hot or cold, Chris Goulding to be the marquee player for a new Tasmanian team. The Tasmanian team starting to pick up more and more fire. These last when is oh, it? Well, you're yeah, no, I'm not good. I actually tried to swallow my mic. <laughs> is starting to pick up a bit more fire in these last. Would Chris Goulding be a great marquee player for a new Tasmanian team to garner interest? So you're saying the team's in next year or just in the future? I'm, I'm saying if the team comes in next year because i got a feeling there's a chance. <laughs> and again, I'm being real. i got a feeling there's a chance <laughs> the team comes in next year from Tasmania. Well, you're right. He's out of contract, which is going to be the massive yeah. thing. But you can't even pronounce his last name, right? <laughs> Golding, um, sorry. You know, Molly actually messaged you. Yeah, his, his wife. Fiance, his wife messaged you. That <laughs> you I, called her fiancé. My- <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, I I'm think- all the show. He's going to be too much of an important piece for Melbourne to lose. He's obviously the face of Melbourne United. It's going to be a tough one, but it's... You say return home. That's a very enticing for a lot of people. I know he likes Tasmania. Is it enticing to return home to Tasmania? <laughs> he likes it. We don't. <laughs> he likes it. Um, but he likes golf down there as well. So who knows? It depends what goes on down there. But um, as if it's hot or cold, without a team officially on the board, I can't give an answer for that one. Okay. Well, that's all we got for hot or cold right now. Let's get a quick Aussie update right now. Dante Exum showing some serious offensive efficiency. As much as the Jazz have let us down the past two games, nine points in the last quarter against Toronto, who... Toronto could be legitimate, and this isn't our topic, so I digress again, but another legitimate contender this year. I'm glad. Oh, we can't talk about that because someone's talking about Pascal Siakam as a potential MVP Spicy P. Why not? He's averaging 25, 8, and 6 or something. Eh, Honeymoon period. But if if, if with those stats, if that's Kawhi Leonard, then he's in the conversation. Yeah, but it's different. Kawhi Leonard, uh, that's a completely different thing because he has a body of work that goes behind it. Well, Spicy P is not Australian, so let's change that. Yeah, yeah, let's mix that back up. Um, Dante Dante started... And this is what it's about for Dante, just getting out on the court because he's had some big summer league games in terms... And I know people say, oh, summer league. But he's had some massive games where he's had 20 points, 10 assists, stuff like that. We know what he can do. We know what he can do and he's he's had the worst run with injury. Worst run with injuries and he's behind so many guards in that team. I would love to yeah. see him on a different type of team. I mean, they're, play, they're playing him in the wing. The one time that Quinn Snyder actually played him as the point guard against Toronto, he came out straight away and started dominating. He played about four minutes in that spot and then and then went out. Utah bring in Mike Conley and someone else and end up bringing uh, Joe Ingles off the bench this year. So a lot of change for the Aussies in Utah that I'm not particularly fond with, but I would love to see yeah, him. Yeah, but on Joe's team. playing. Joe's playing his role. He doesn't need to be a scorer as much with Conley in there. I'd like to see Dante and on the, the ball Hawks. sticks a bit. I'd like Conley to see Dante, Dante on the Hawks. I would love. To, I would love to see Dante on another team. Yeah, I would love to see Dante on the but Knicks. Yeah, he's, play him. Play, play him. Play, play the boy. Moments. Leave him. Has Simmons and, and I'm not trying to be negative here. Well, you are. You've already started. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No offense, but has Ben Simmons taken a step back this year? No, they've loaded that roster again even more. It was loaded last year. Dope. Tobias Harris. They bring in Al Horford. You bring in Josh Richardson. 
He's doing what he has to do. This is we talk about steps back and look at Melbourne United. You bring in these certain rosters, these guys that it's hard to continue that the same stats you had. I think he had a really good game today and yesterday. So it's weird that you brought up um, him right now. <laughs> I wrote the rundown on Monday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, um, but no, he hasn't. He's doing what he has to do in that team. I don't know what you're you expecting him to average a triple double. Yeah, I'm expecting him to be. I, I thought this this year coming into it. Well, one, I thought that he was going to come out and shoot more. You know why he can't do that? Because the rebounds and B gets rebounds. Uh, Al Horford, they bring in who likes to crash the glass, and Tobias Harris is elite. He's yeah, no, legit. I, I, I am being harsh with it. I, I just think again, I came in with such lofty expectations for this year, and it's still early days. So between so anyone listening to our podcast, Felix von Hoff hates Lamelo Ball and Ben Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love them both. I have lofty expectations, but anyway, someone who had lofty expectations and then completely let all the punters down was Pete Hooley. Right now, with our NBL best bets of the week, because the tally right now, so we start with a hundred dollars each week. Yep. You're currently sitting on a lowly 76. So I'm not zero. While the man no. over here, do not interrupt me while I'm Sorry. tooting my own horn, is sitting on $159 with a massive win after he backed in the snakes. Yeah, look, Melbourne let me down last week. There's no surprise about that. They went up to Cairns, couldn't get it done. But it's early days, man. I've got plenty of time to bounce back. I used to do that with the horses all the time and I'd throw it all on wings <laughs> and still not get back at six. Bounce back for me then. What do you got this week? Where's your money uh, going? The multi of Melbourne to win and then they're playing uh, Adelaide at home. It'll be a tough game, but I think Melbourne will bounce back. 20 bucks on that multi and then Brisbane to beat New Zealand in New Zealand. I think Brisbane will get it done. Hopefully, Scotty Hobson's not back. Please don't be <laughs> for this weekend. Uh, $20 on Perth on the line against the Phoenix coming in. We know what Perth did against the Phoenix, but they were in Perth. But they're coming off a loss that Perth always liked to bounce back. Phoenix had a good win. I just want to get it at the line. I think they'll be all right. Don't interrupt me. And 60 bucks. I should have put it all on the Kings to beat Cairns. All right, well, and you seem to have gone in a lot of depth explaining your stuff there. And usually when you're doing something right, you don't have to explain it. So I'm just going to run through mine fairly quickly. And punters, if you want to take advantage, then do so responsibly. I've only ever had two bets in my life I've been confident about. Winks <laughs> and Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> the grey. I've gone with $50 on the multi Melbourne, Brisbane and South East Melbourne to Ooh. win. $50 and the NZ win against Brisbane. I think Brisbane let us down. So that's going to be a big one because we've both taken opposite sides on Which the New Zealand Brisbane week, games. But I'm also, that multi Melbourne, Brisbane, South East, again, another donation. Just give it to me so I can pay it. It was a donation. Parking. I wouldn't be sitting on $156. Yeah, you're getting a bit arrogant with that argument. <laughs> well, that's enough trash talking for this week. That's all we got time for. You can tune in either on YouTube, podcast, whatever service you want, or maybe you can just hit me and Pete up on Twitter and we'll come down to your lounge room and just repeat this entire conversation in there. That'd be it. Take I'd it on the road. It. As long as you've got a coffee, I'm there. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in and we will see you next Tuesday.